All right, so today we're talking about making decisions, if statement, case statement, uh, other details about uh, branching to do specific code based on uh, individual conditions. So uh, we've got a file to download today. So over on the blog, September 29th, uh, I changed this file maybe 25 minutes ago. So if you thought you're gonna really get ready for class early and download that you know, well before you got here, um, you'll probably wanna go ahead and download it again. So you get the food inspections too. Uh, file. Uh, and then here's the code. So what is this code? I think this may be, or this is the data. I think this is the first time we've looked at this data. It's a data set that I play with, with kind of various things, but this is um, inspections. It's like uh, food establishment inspections in the city of Chicago. So if we look at a particular line here, let me just zoom in a bit, get ourselves oriented to the data. This is talking about a particular inspection for, uh, who do we want to do? The Melrose Diner. Here's you know, row 20, the Melrose Diner. So that's their license number. So that's you know, whatever number they're identified with in the city of Chicago. They're a restaurant. They're a high risk. What does that mean? My goodness, this restaurant's high risk. Should you eat there? Like every restaurant's high risk. What that means is that they're dealing with food that if they're not careful with it, it can kill you right? Like, like raw meat, you're starting with raw meat and you're not treating it properly. People are going to get sick and die. From it. That's what high risk means. Uh, what's a medium risk restaurant? McDonald's up here, medium risk. Why is McDonald's medium risk? Because I think they still start with raw meat. Maybe they don't start with raw meat anymore. I don't know. Uh, who else is medium down here? Grocery store, medium. So that means if they're a food establishment, they're selling stuff that's ready to eat. Um, but apparently what they're selling here ready to eat, it might just be like uh, soft serve ice cream or something that would, they would still need a food establishment permit for that. Uh, but, that, but soft serve ice cream is a low risk uh, item. By the way, can ice cream go bad enough, go bad such that if you eat it, it will kill you? Yeah, it can, but you don't eat it when it goes bad that way. I mean, that'd be crazy to do. Um, high risk food is like, yeah, you wouldn't kind of no other indicator uh, and you could still find yourself really sick. All right, uh, we got address where they're located. Ah, so this is kind of the reason that they had an inspection. So. Uh, I think Canvas is just, you know, this is just the normal inspection that we do every, you know, every year or so. But this one here on row 20 looks like someone complained. There's some complaint. So you know, whatever Department of Food Inspection there is in Chicago received a complaint. They sent someone out to take a look at it. Here's the results of the inspection. They failed the inspection. And uh, latitude and longitude of the location. Actually, we could find out why they failed just by taking the inspection ID and coming over here to the violations table finding that inspection ID. And it looks like they, ooh, they had quite a few comments here. Uh, corrected, this is like they're going back to fix it. So they fixed a bunch of these things. Not corrected, must be used. What's one, they, they violated this one. Previous minor violations corrected. Anyway, so notes about you know exactly what happened there. Comes observed excessive grease and dust accumulating. Observed half the basement sump pump covered in something, cover or the cover is missing. So and we get you know some gruesome details that make you wonder maybe I shouldn't ever eat out at all. Uh, but you know so this is data. When is this data from? Probably has a date here. When it was, I think it's 2016 that I downloaded the data. 2017. Okay. So it's but but it's just some data that's got some variation in it that we can use to make decisions um, uh, about the data behave differently based on what we're what we're seeing differently in the data. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. What I think I'd like to do, um, I think we'll do some things where we're kind of highlighting some things, um, you know, based on different conditions that we're finding. But I think I'd like to start off by saying, you know what, I'd like to, I'd like to pull all of the inspections that meet a certain criteria and put them over here on this sheet called list, which is just a blank sheet. So let's go ahead and kind of get that and kind of get our, um, get ourselves set up to be able to do that. So I'm not sure I just pressed, but apparently it wasn't Alt F11. Delete, I'm really sure. Alt F11, there we go. All right, it looks like we already have a module here and it should be an empty module. Okay, so let's, let's start by creating a sub procedure that uh, we're just gonna call copy data. So 
So copy data. Now, when we run this sub procedure, we're gonna tell it, listen, we want a sheet that we're gonna copy from. We're gonna want a row that we wanna copy the data from. And we're gonna want a sheet that we're gonna copy it to. So we need those, we'll tell it those three things. And then we'll use those variables um, to actually make the copy happen. So I'm gonna want a source sheet. Let's call it SRC. We'll just call it SRC as a worksheet. So that means when we call this function, we are not going to give it the name of a worksheet. We're going to give it a reference to a worksheet. So what's an example of how we could refer to a worksheet? You know, what's one way that we could refer to a particular worksheet? Okay, so you could say active sheet. That would be a reference to a worksheet. You could say uh, the sheets collection, the worksheets collection, and you know, just give it a number, number one. But it's not the name of a worksheet we're passing, but we're actually passing a reference to a worksheet. We we'll want to know a row that we're copying. So I'll call this um, maybe SRC row as a long integer. And then dest as a worksheet as well. Now, do we need a row on the worksheet that we're going to be putting it to? And I think the answer to that is no, because we're just gonna put it on the first available row on that worksheet. So we'll figure out, we're just gonna append it to the bottom of the list. Okay. So I think the first thing we wanna do is we wanna calculate what is, you know, where is the bottom of the list? And so this is a little review from some stuff we've done before, but let's go ahead and get, a, a, let's uh, create a variable for that row, dest row as a long integer. And then let's give dest row a value. Dest row equals, okay, so let's look at our destination worksheet. So now dest is going to be a reference to whatever worksheet we passed in. So you told us to put it to this worksheet. This is the reference to that particular worksheet. We're going to look at the very bottom cell, the very bottom cell on the first column. So cells, how can I ask how many cells there are on a, on a, on a how many cells there are on a worksheet? Cells dot count, um, let's see, rows dot count. And column one. So there's 1.04 million rows. And so rows dot count is gonna be 1.04 million. So that is gonna be the very bottom cell on whichever worksheet we're gonna be sending the data to. So instead of actually just putting in here you know, you're, you're used to seeing it like this, where you give it a row number and a column number. I'm saying, no, I want you to calculate the row number, just whatever the bottom is. Um, the truth is, would we be okay with, you know, putting that and saying the bottom? Yeah, we're probably okay with that. Even if sometime in the future, our worksheet ends up with more cells than that, it's probably going to be low enough to start because I'm starting down there really low so that I can come up and find where the, where the first free data is, where the first uh, cell that's not free so that I can offset it by one. So I'll just do, but I will just go ahead and do rows.count. Either way would be fine, but this is just a little more general. Um, now from there, I want to do end. So I'll run the end method and tell it that I want to go up X, L, U, P. And that will refer to a cell. That will be the cell that it bumps into. So it'll be the cell that actually has the data in it. I don't want to have that number. I want to be, I want to know the row of that cell and I'll add one to it. So the destination row, whew, the long line that says, start at the bottom, come up until I find data and then go one below it. So it should find the last data that's in column A and then return the number of the row that's one below it. Just show me on a scale of zero to five, how comfortable you are with this five. I totally get that. Uh, somewhere less is, Okay, so it looks like most of you are right up there, four or five. Um, okay, good. All right. So now we know where to put it. So now we just want to copy the row from the source row. So we'll say SRC, that's the worksheet, that's our source, dot, and we're just going to copy the whole row. So rows, and then we'll give it the source row, which is a number. So if I've said copy row five, we will have passed a five into this variable. We'll be now referring to source row five. And there's a copy method. 
Normally what we do is we just copy the method and somewhere we go and paste it, but it turns out the copy method has an argument called destination. I can just tell it exactly where to go paste it, kind of right just as part of the copy method. And so that is just going to be something really similar to this. My destination is gonna be my dest rows, now my dest row. So we're going to, we're copying it, we're calling the copy method, and we're giving it the, the uh, destination parameter. So my Visual Basic editor is not quite smart enough to realize that this is going to be a reference to a range here. But if I wanted to, just to kind of peek at it, I could dim R as a range. Don't do this because I'm going to delete it. Just watch it. R dot copy. And then I can see that it is giving me a destination here. So. Um, this is just a little trick to say, listen, Visual Basic Editor, you're not quite you know, smart enough to figure out that this is gonna be a reference to a range. So I'll give it one that it can figure out as a reference to a range. So when I say dot copy, it will give me the, the IntelliSense help with it. I think that will work. Let's just go ahead and give it a try. And we're gonna call, I'll just call this from the immediate window. So the, the method or the procedure is called copy data. And I'm going to give it a sheet. Let me go ahead and view my project explorer. And what we'll see is that these sheets have names. So I've got a sheet called inspection, which is the one that the label says food inspections. So I can refer to that sheet just by its code name inspection. Uh, and then list has a code name of list. So my source is gonna be inspection. The row I'm going to copy from is I'll just copy from the second row. And my destination sheet is going to be list. So that should call this sub procedure. It should pass in a reference to that worksheet. The two will go into the variable called source row, and list will be the dest worksheet. Oh, hopefully, when I run that, it'll bring a line up. Yeah, so it just copied that row. This should be whatever was the second row from there. So we've got a restaurant called Piccolo Mondo Cafe. And that's what I'm on the second row. Let's go ahead and pull the 20th row, which is the Melrose Diner, changing this to 20. It should put that onto my list as well. So now I've got the Melrose Diner. Okay. Questions? on this sub procedure. Tell me how comfortable you are with this whole sub procedure, scale of zero to five. Zero is this is witchcraft, five is, I totally got it. I'm seeing fours, fours, four, 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 threes. Okay, good. Okay, so, you know, so building this is just so that, you know, we can kind of see the results of, you know, what we're gonna do to try to kind of, you know, maybe do some little custom reporting here. So let's create another sub procedure. And let's just do one that says, we wanna see what all of our low risk restaurants are. Now, you know, some of this stuff is, would be so simple. You say, well, just make this into a table and you can do it as a filter. Yeah, that's another way that we could do this. We're gonna be getting to some things that are more complex. It would be a little, it would be really quite, uh, quite difficult to do with a filter, but it's just a pretty good way that we can start working with the various kinds of, of statements that we have. So I'll make this sub procedure that just says show, um, low risk, show low risk, show, show low risk. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through all the whole set of inspections here. So let's just go ahead and do, we've done this kind of a loop before pretty often. So let me dim row as a long integer. Let me give row an initial value, start at the second row. So R O W equals two, and then we'll go into a do loop. Do until uh, the name of my sheet is inspection. Do until until inspection dot cells row number row column number one dot value is a zero length string. Loop. As soon as I do a do loop, I'm always going to want to put in a do events to let myself out of that loop in case it kind of runs out of control. All right, that just tells the interpreter pause once through this loop to see if I'm trying to do anything to get your attention. 
I'll make sure that I increment the row here. So row equals row plus one. Now, just to make sure that my, my row or that my loop is working, kind of after I've done this part, I'm just gonna go ahead and let me just run this once by just printing off those values. So I've you know, written a few lines of code here. Can I write that many lines of code without making a mistake? Not usually. It'll be a great miracle if this runs, uh, but all this should do is it should um, just display off the inspection IDs. Well, maybe I'll do the names instead. So I'll do column two. Uh, uh, row equals row plus one. I thought it would be a miracle. All right, so it looks like we're getting those we're getting those um, listed off here. Maybe I'll just also print out the row as well. So we're getting down to row 77. Do we only have 77 rows of data? Yeah, 77, well, 76 rows of data ending on the 77th row. Okay. So now what I wanna do, instead of printing this, uh, I want to decide. So now we're going to introduce the if statement. So let's look at the simplest version of the simplest form of the if statement. If, and now I'm going to put some condition here. A condition whew, is a certain kind of expression. I don't think I've told you what an expression is. An expression is any VBA code that I can execute and, and evaluates down to a single value. So um, what do you think? Is five an expression? Yeah, the value five is an expression. I can say print five, it would print five. It looks at that five, it goes, yeah, I know what you mean, five. How about four plus one? Is that an expression? Yeah, the interpreter can look at that and say, yeah, it's, it's not just a single value, but I can figure out what single value you're talking about. Um, uh, how about, let's see, what are some, is there any function? I think there's a function that we've looked at. There's one called the in string function that starts at a particular place, looks at a particular string. Uh, looks for a particular value and will return where it finds this string inside of this string. So if I run that, it comes back with a value of seven. What do you think? Is that an expression? Yeah, that's an expression. Well, how about this? This whole expression here equals seven. Is that an expression? Yeah, that evaluates the true. So this is not just an expression, it is a condition. So a condition is an expression that evaluates the true or false. So when it's, when it's done figuring it out, it's true or false. I could say this whole thing right here is greater than seven. And what's the answer to that? What does that evaluate to? It's false, it equals seven, it's not greater than seven, right? I can say greater than or equal to seven, that'll be true. So what I have to have after my if is I have to have something that evaluates the true or false. Uh, and so what I wanna do is how do I tell if this thing is a low risk? How, how can I tell if it's a low risk entity? Oh, right here. So it's gonna say risk. Did we ever find any low ones? Here's low. Here's a restaurant that's a low risk. What is this? It's a sushi bar that's low risk. What's that? Oh, it's all raw. But still, but I think you're starting with, yeah, you're not cooking it, but it's raw. That's, a, that's strange. Uh, that, uh, <laughs> uh, I think money changed hands somewhere to make that happen. I don't know. Anyway, that's what we want to know. You know, we want to see what the whole list is. Maybe so we could review it and say, did any of these look wrong? Okay, so I'm looking for column F. So instead of looking at column three here, I could look at A, B, C, D, E, F, that's six. Or of course, instead of putting a six there for column F, I could put F uh, in quotes. Um, so if my current row that I'm on, column F is equal to, And let me go ahead and copy this value. Then, and then I can put right here on this, 
on this line, I can put some, something that I want to do. So I want to copy data from inspection. Which row do I want to copy it from? Yeah, from row, 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 row your boat. I don't know. Uh, then over to the list. So that should put that one, um, it should put all the low risk ones at the bottom. Uh, we've got a couple in here. And so they're going to just append here, but let's just go ahead and run it and see how it goes. So it looks like we only found two. Um, see risk three low, that looks right. So maybe that when I start this off, I would like to clear off all of the cells. So let's just go ahead and do this. Um, I wanna completely wipe out whatever we have on list, on our, on our list sheet. So I'll just say list.cells. Now, normally you're used to seeing a reference to dot cells and then telling me just exactly which cell you're interested in. But I'm gonna say list.cells without telling you which one I want. Which, which cell does that evaluate to? It evaluates to all of the cells. This is a range of all of the cells. And so here I can just call the clear method and that will, see L E A R, that will then clear out the whole worksheet. Um, I don't think it'll clear formatting. Maybe it does clear formatting. Yeah, there's, I think it clears, even clears the formatting. There's a separate one called clear contents that would just clear out the data without touching the formatting. So now if I run this, it should start by clearing off everything that's there, and then it should put in the ones that meet the criteria, and then those are the two. Uh, incidentally, there's another way that kind of makes sense to do this as well. So I just want to introduce you to, because I probably won't ever see it again, but it's a really useful one to know, and that's called the used range. So the used range uh, is a property of the sheet, uh, and it is just the smallest rectangle that contains all the data on the worksheet. So this just says, I'm gonna clear off, not all the cells, just the cells that have, the, that have data in it. Uh, is this any more efficient than the last one? Probably not. Um, it's not really gonna, I mean, does it even have time to even think about all the whole cells in the worksheet? No, I mean, there's, how many cells are there in the worksheet? There's like more than, 64 trillion, is that right? There's, there's a crazy number of cells in a worksheet. So the difference between saying clear the used range and clear all of them, it's not really gonna go and, and, and touch each one of those cells if you say to do something to all of them. It knows there's some that don't have data in it, it's not even gonna think about those. But this, will, this should do, a, do the exact same thing. Okay, questions here? It turns out that, um, like back in the very early days of basic, this was the only structure of the if statement that you had. So you could, you could execute one line conditionally based on whether it was if, it was really ugly. They've, you know, fortunately, they've, they've improved it since then. Let me just show you something else here, although I don't ever want you to do this. You can put a colon here and say, you know what, I wanna just, I wanna do another statement right here on the same one line. Like debug.print. Uh, what row number we're on. So it's gonna, it's gonna write those two out there and it's gonna uh, also print the row numbers that it found them on. Um, don't do that. The truth is if you wanna put two statements on, a, VBA assumes you're putting one statement per line. How many of you have worked in a language where you have to put a semicolon at the end of every statement? Yeah, so in that, in those languages, it says, listen, you can put, you can, you, can, you can take a statement, you can break it across multiple lines if you want. Um, you can put you know, multiple statements on one line because you're gonna tell me when the statement ends, put the semicolon. In VBA, they assume you're putting one statement per line. So there's no need to tell it where the end of the statement is. If you wanna put two statements on the same line, you have to say, oh, well somehow tell me that there's these are two different statements and that's what the colon does. But that's not, if you have two statements that you wanna execute as a result of this one condition, don't do it that way. Instead, right after the then, you're gonna bring it down onto its own line and you'll put these as two different statements and then you'll say, and if. 
if there's nothing after the then, that changes the form of the statement to be what's called a block if statement. A block if statement then says, um, we've got some if, we hit this if line, oh, it's true. We're gonna execute all the lines until we find an end if. <sighs> and if it's not true, if the condition is not true, or if the condition is false, it has to be one of those two things. If the condition is false, then it will jump to the next end if, and it will then continue executing from there. So if you've got multiple lines that you wanna execute, this is the proper way to do it. Even though you could squeeze it all onto one line, I'm not sure why you would. Uh, and so yeah, we should see that this executes exactly the same way. Questions? Okay, let's, um, let me just make a little mistake here. Let's just say I was going to put my end if in and somehow I put it down here after the loop. This is, this is something that's, it's actually a mistake that's pretty common for beginning programmers. So what I have here now is I have something that's a little bit weird. I have an if statement that kind of has a, a start and an end and I've got, a, a loop that has a start and an end, and those are interleaved with each other. So they overlap each other, and you're not allowed to overlap structures like that. You can start a new structure inside of another structure or put another structure totally outside of the other structure, but they can't overlap the way that these do. The, and the reason I'm showing you this is because the error message that you get is not what you expect. Let me go ahead and hit play here. And here's the error. Uh, loop without a do. Why is that a difficult? Why is that difficult to understand? Yeah. What do you mean there's no do? It's right here. I can totally see it. Well, what does it mean there's a loop without a do? It means it came along here and it said, ah, oh, here we're starting a do loop. That's great. And now it gets to an if, and it says, all right. Well, the end if is down here, so it's kind of going through here, somewhere between here. Inside of this loop, it says or inside this if statement, it finds this word loop. And it says, there's, if there's a loop inside of this if statement, there has to be a do inside of this if statement. So the reason that error message is so tough is because you look at that and you say, well, wait a minute, I can totally see the do, it's right there. You know, VBA interpreter, you're, you're crazy. But it's because it's saying, wait, I found, I found this loop on the inside of an if statement. So there has to be a do that's also on the inside of this if statement. That makes sense? Okay. Okay, so this is gonna be show low risk. Um, that's fine. Let me go ahead and um, I'm gonna copy this and we'll just kind of put a button on that example and we'll, we'll, we'll I'll copy it um, to be another example. And so here, let me say, we're gonna do show low risk or uh, let's do show medium risk. Um, show failed medium risk. Okay, so now what we wanna do is we wanna show, we're gonna show those, those inspections that are medium risk establishments and the inspection was a fail, a failure. So I'm gonna change my condition here to be a two medium. I think that's probably right. Let me just go ahead and run this now by itself and let's see uh, if that brings back some medium, some medium risk establishments. And let's just also see, make sure we do have some failures here. Yeah, so we've got a few that are, have failed. Okay, so now, this right now is showing all of the failed establishments, or I'm sorry, it's showing all of the medium risk establishments. But what I wanna do is I wanna show the ones that are medium risk and have failed. So this brings up the idea of a complex condition. So right here is my condition, right? We're just checking to see if the particular row that we're on is equal to, to risk medium. So now what I'm gonna do and because this line is getting pretty long, I think I'm gonna go ahead and break it into multiple lines. What do I have to do to make one line go onto multiple lines? 
one statement going to multiple lines? What character allows me to do that? You might have seen it in the macro recorder, although I don't think I've shown it to you in class yet. It's not a period. It's an underscore, yeah. And actually it's an underscore, but there has to be a space in front of it. So kind of space underscore. And then I'll go ahead and, and bring my then down. And then let me go ahead and put a space underscore here. Okay, so now I'm gonna come in here and say, and. So now this part is gonna to evaluate to true or false. Every time it looks, it checks this. And so when it's a medium risk, okay, that's good. When it's a medium risk, when that's true, and when column M is fail. So I'll just go ahead and it's gonna be similar to this. So I'm just gonna copy this line down here. And column M is equal to fail. Need a space before the underscore. So now this whole condition has to be true. Everything between the if and the then has to evaluate to true or false. So you remember back when in like maybe pre-calculus or trigonometry or something, you built something called a truth table. You remember these? Where like true and true, what is that? True, yeah, true or false is, true or false is, yeah, true. Uh, false or false is false, yeah. And so there's some, some logic that you learned about, you know, what happens when you combine uh, you know, using or uh, and or and not, you know, with expressions that evaluate true or false. Um, maybe you wondered, why do I ever have to learn this? Well, you have to learn that for today. You learned that back in high school. So when you got to this class, you'd be ready to deal with this. So for um, if, if both arguments uh, on both sides of the and, I should say, technically, and is called an operator. It's a logical operator. And the things that are on, the, on both sides of the operator are called operands. So if both operands are true, then the whole thing will be true, right? So I can say true and true equals true. True and false is false. False and false is false. False and true is what? Also, also false. So for true, you've got to have both of them to be true. So now the only ones we'll get should be the ones that are that, that this condition is true and this condition is true. And that should give us then fewer of these. And so if we look here, how many do we see that have failed? One, two, three. So I'm expecting to see three of these that have failed. So I'll run this now. And that's come down to just the three that meet both of those conditions. Uh, and let's just check them real quick. So they're both um, low, uh, medium risk, or all three medium risk, and all three have failed. Who are they, by the way? I wonder. Starbucks coffee? Man, it just makes me wonder, what do you have to do to fail an inspection at Starbucks coffee? Too many cockroaches in the coffee would definitely do it. Um, it looks like there's only one food protected during storage preparation. Let's see. Comments found two preparation skins at front counter area next to espresso machines with no barrier between them, customers and employees. Between customers and employees must provide barrier sneezers. No sneeze guards. They left out the sneeze guards. That, that will do it. Okay, um, so what would happen if we changed our and to an or? What would you expect? Can you describe the results in general? Yeah, so should we get more or less results? A few more or a lot more? Yeah, probably a lot more because now if, it's, if this is true, if anyone that's risked or anyone that fails, that's going to be a lot. Let's just go ahead and run it and just see. Yeah, so that, that bringing a lot. So we should be able to look at everyone that's here. So here's risk two. So that one should is here because it's risk two. It doesn't necessarily need to have failed. Yeah, so it passed. So um, that one's here because it's risk two. That's not risk two, so it must have failed. So look over here, that one must fail. 
we should still be able to see one that is both risk to kind of the same three should still be in here because they happen to meet both conditions, but the or just says, you know what, if either one of them does. So we've got 28. Interestingly, this is not one that you have much use for often, but there's a, a different operator called exclusive or XOR. And XOR, um, if, if either one of them is true, then the whole thing's true. So false or true, true or true, uh, no, true or false, but true or true is gonna be false. Because it's an exclusive war, it says, it really is just one. It's, it's just one of them. So if they're both true, not allowed. Uh, I think I've used exclusive or like in my coding, like once in my whole life. It's not an operator that I've found a lot of use for. Um, but maybe it's because I don't think about it very often. Maybe if I thought about it more, I'd find other ways to use it. So if I use this as exclusive or, describe to me my result set. Should I expect to see more or fewer results? So I changed or to exclusive or. There should be three less. So the three that I, that I had with and should now pop out of this. And so I've got 25 instead of 28. <sighs> what else can we do here? So we've got an operator called not. What does not do? Not just reverses whatever's inside of it. So if this evaluates the true, uh, now the whole expression with the not is going to evaluate to false. It's just going to reverse the decision on each line. So what do we have? Something like 77 rows, 76 rows, 25. So we should have, you know, around 50, 51, um, because this should just give me the other half of the set. 52 rows it gave us. How, how complex can my conditions get? way more complex than you can deal with, right? I mean, you, your interpreter is gonna blow out way before the, uh, the Excel interpreter will. Is there some limit? There may be some limit. I don't know what it is. So uh, the thing to realize though, is that the place, the, the place that, one of the, one of the biggest places that programming errors are made that kind of make it into production is in really complex conditions. Um, and the reason is, is because you can go through all, a whole lot of testing and it's really tough to actually test all the possible conditions to see if it's behaving the way you want it to behave. So just realize that anytime you start making complex conditions, especially when not gets involved, you just, you gotta say, okay, I'm doing something really dangerous. So I'm gonna make sure that I've really thought through this well. Okay, questions? Uh, so this is failed medium risk. So I'm gonna go ahead and put this back to what it is. Oh, by the way, I should be able to change this to uh, or no, let me go ahead and change, get rid of the, or change that back to and, and get rid of my not. And so now this example actually does what the, uh, what the title suggests that it will do. Any questions on this one? Go ahead. So somewhere in here, so you want to make sure that you've got a space underscore at the end of at the end of all the lines between the if and the then. That is exactly it. Now it's trouble. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. So if you were uh, if you were on the just on the video, the problem was, hey, no matter what I do in here, I end up with a red line, and it's because he was missing a space underscore somewhere. Was it the space or the underscore you were missing? The underscore there, the space. Yeah, the space. In fact, if you if you ask. Um, you know, read documentation. What is the under, what, you know, what is the line continuing continuation character? Let's say it's the underscore, but the underscore is not enough because, well, partially because underscore is a valid character in, in, a, in an identifier. So if you, so value underscore or a variable named uh, better over here, we could have a variable named row underscore. That's a valid character name, a valid variable name. And so it can't just be by itself. It actually has to be by a space. But even then, you would think that after this quote, there's no you know, quote underscore isn't anything. 
but you still have to have the space in front of it. So it really is two character sequence space underscore that you need to say this is the line continuation sequence. Okay, let's go ahead and, um, yes, go ahead. Ah, so the question is, how does the code node to paste? You're seeing that we're calling copy. Where did it go? So we're calling a copy right here. How does it know to paste? Whew. Do you want to see a little bit about, you know, kind of the help system in VBA that might better be called the no help system? Let me press F2 here, and that should bring up um, this kind of um, object. Explain it's called the object object browser. And let me see if I can get to this statement here. I'm not sure if I can. This is, uh, oh yeah, I should be able to because this is a method of a particular object. So I'm gonna look for the range object. And I'm looking for a class called range. Range is, seems like there should be a class just called range. Did I pass it? Oh, there it is, range. Okay, so now I'm looking at the, oh, it's over here too, by the way. So here's the range class. Here are all of the properties and methods of range. So when you're getting IntelliSense help while you're editing, it's just bringing up this list right here. So I should be able to come down here and find the copy method. So there should be a method here called copy. Copy. And that's great. So right down here, let me zoom in here. Windows plus. So while I've, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the range class, I'm looking at the copy method. Down here, it tells me what this is. It's called copy, and it tells me there's a destination that goes here. Now I call this the no help system because. This would actually be helpful if it said one little statement here about what this method does. You know, but I don't get any description about actually what this is. So it shows me what the objects and methods are, but doesn't give me any help about you know, what actually does. But what this means is having done a little trial and error and maybe done some reading elsewhere, if you provide a destination range here, that's when you say copy, it actually pastes it to that location. And I think it does one other thing. Let me just go ahead and check it and see if that's true. Um, I think that when you do that, it does not interrupt the clipboard, which is really, which is really great. So let me just uh, say hi, copy this and paste it. Okay, so I'm on my clipboard right now is the word hi. If this actually interrupts the clipboard when I do the copy data set, when I hit this copy statement, then when I paste, it's not gonna paste hi. So I'll go ahead and run this again, which is calling my copy data procedure. Went through and did all that. Now the question is what's on my clipboard and I'll paste. Oh, pity. It does interrupt the clipboard. So the high is gone. Uh, I wonder if I could actually come here and paste if that would be on the clipboard. No, like nothing's on the clipboard. So yeah, I was, I was hopeful that if you put that in, it wouldn't interrupt the clipboard because the truth is we probably shouldn't be interrupting the clipboard with our code. But the clipboard kind of belongs to the user. And so if you put something on the clipboard, you expect it to be there until you take it off. But in this case, our code is actually using the clipboard to accomplish what it's trying to do here. Is there a question in the back? No? Okay. Um, did that answer your question? You're comfortable with that answer? All right. So now, here's what I'd like to do. Um, I would like to introduce a little more complexity to the if then uh, and if statement. I'm gonna introduce the else clause. So what I'd like to do to introduce the else, so the idea behind the else clause is that let's look at, we come down here to this kind of simpler version of the if statement. So looking at this if statement, I'll highlight the condition. So we get to the if and it says, great, everything before the then, we gotta evaluate to true or false. If it's true, we execute the code between uh, before the end if, if it's false, we drop right to the end if. But there is also another clause that we can put in the if statement. I'm gonna copy show uh, low risk 
I'm not quite sure what to call this yet. Let me just call it XXXXX. Because uh, what I can do here now is I can put in here an else clause. So now, if this is true, we execute everything to the else clause and then we jump to the end if. If it's false, we jump to the else clause and then execute going down from there. So what would it make sense to do? We're gonna check to see if it's low risk, we're gonna bring it in if it's low risk. If it's not low risk, well, we could actually just do a kind of another example here. So if it's not low risk, let's, um, let's just go ahead and print the, print the name out. Debug.print and Uh, we'll print column two, which is the name of the establishment. So this is going to be low risk with print. So I'll run this. We should get a bunch printed off. So we've gotten the ones that are low risk showing here, and then the others are showing here. Uh, any questions on the else clause? Okay, let's do a different example for the else if clause. So I'm just going to call this, uh, I'll call this highlight. All right, so now Instead of copying the data, I'm going to want to maybe highlight, uh, just kind of go, with, go over there and highlight the data. So if it's low risk, I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to go ahead and make that green. So uh, inspection cells, that particular cell, and I'm going to change the uh, interior color equal to VB green. So um, let's, let me just kind of introduce you uh, colors for a moment here. I'm going to do an active cell. Dot interior. Equals. Now, uh, the interior color uh, is going to be a number between zero and 16 million, 777,000. It's a big number. Um, and so I can just pick one. Um, let's just go ahead and here's my active cell right here. Uh, zero, there's a few I know by name. Zero is black. So that'll make that interior black or that I know by number. Um, 255 is red. I'll just change it red. Uh, my favorite one, I think is kind of eerily appropriate. 666 is dark red. Um, but you know, you can pick, a, pick another number, um, 1 million. It's some color of dark green. So there's a million different colors and the color property is just, you know, is just one of those. Now, VB green is just a predefined constant. It's a predefined variable, a location in memory that has a value in it. You can't change it, which is why it's called a constant. And this call, it's just a number. So it is that number 65,280. And so if I put that number in here, that goes to green, which is the same as using the constant because the constant is the location in memory that has that number in it. And so that's why that will turn the active cell to green. Questions? In the homework that's due tonight, I think I'm recommending you work not with the color property, but with the color index property. I think there's 52 different color indices. Uh, I think they're numbered zero through 52 or 51, and then like negative 41, 42, which means no color at all. Um, but we're just gonna work with color right here. 
So this should now um, make it green. Otherwise, let's go ahead and put it as, uh, we'll put it as yellow. So we will turn, not column F, but we'll do column B to green. Otherwise, we're gonna turn it to yellow. Okay, so now we're not copying any data over here. We're just changing the properties of this particular, uh, of this particular data. So now looking at this, they're green, otherwise they're yellow. Now, other thing that I wanna show here is that here on the else clause, I could nest another if statement in here. So instead of just saying this is what happens else, I could have another if statement right here. If, if it's medium, then we'll go yellow. Oops, this is two medium. I think I better reset that color up here at the top. So let's start off this example by saying uh, inspection dot columns to dot interior dot color index equals negative 41, 42. Negative. Uh, negative 4142 is um, also there's a variable for it, XL none. So we can just, instead of using that number, we can put in XL none here. Okay. So now that should wipe that out. And now we should get our, if it's low, it should be green. If it's medium, it should be yellow. Otherwise, what will it be? Yeah, well, it'll just be. Uh, it'll be no color at all. Ah, uh, so else inspection cells row F value. Oh, it should say risk two. There it is. Thank you. There, we've got some yellows and our greens are still in there. Okay, one of the places that uh, we end up putting you know, real, real errors into production is complex conditions. The other place that it's really common to put errors into production is heavily nested if statements. And so um, you want to avoid nesting if statements when you can. So much so that when they're making the language VBA, they said, you know what, it's common enough to have to do something like this, check some condition, and if that's false, check some other condition, and if that's false, check some other condition, that they built that into uh, actually a formal part of the if statement. So uh, let me just do one more thing here. Let's put an else clause on here. And let's make those red, let's make everything else red. So now we should get you know, either red, green, or yellow. But this is, a net, this is a nested if. This is an if nested inside an if. So what they said was, they said, listen, if you're going to be checking this condition and say, well, if that one's false, check this condition. If that one's false, check this, this condition. If that one's false, check this condition. They say, no, and, and don't nest it. Instead, use the else if clause. So now there's another keyword, else if which now has its own condition and its own then, but the else is still legal here. And we only need one and if because we don't, because it's only one statement. So now the way this flows, it says, all right, if this is true, we execute this code and then we hit that else if and we're done. Drop to the end if and, and keep executing. If that's false, then immediately jump to the next else if and check this one to see if it's true. 
and I can have as many else ifs as I want. So now I should be able to check to see if it's at risk is medium. I have another else if in here to say if it's risk one high. Then that one will make VB red. Otherwise, if it's not um, high, low, or medium, there's probably some mistake. What color should we use for a mistake? Blue is kind of a dark blue. So we'll probably also want to change the fonts color to white. We probably want that on the red as well. You have any blue? Yeah, so here's one that's in blue. What's the problem here? There's just no risk. Risk level zero, I guess. Only one. Okay, questions? Let me, um, I'm gonna copy this and we're gonna make highlight two. So I wanted to kind of show something else here. So this will be highlight two or highlight two. Now, I want you to notice something about this. In each condition, in each case, we are looking at exactly the same value here. We are checking to see if the current row in column F is something. If not, we're checking it for something else. If not, we're checking it for something else. If not, well, we're done checking at this point. If you are always checking, if, if, if in this kind of check this, otherwise check this, otherwise check this, otherwise check this, if you have that structure and you're always looking back to a single condition where we are here looking at a particular cell, it's the same cell, then you probably don't want to use else if. Else if will still work, but there's a cleaner syntax to do exactly the same thing. What we've said is that this is so common that we wrote a syntax just for dealing with this one saying, I'm gonna do you know, several different things based on what's in this one cell. And so that is called the select case. It's just a different way to branch, no if statement involved. So instead of if, I'm gonna put select, and then I'm gonna say case, and then I'm gonna put the thing that I'm looking at. Then inside the structure, I will say case again, and then the thing that I'm checking for equality for. And if that then is true, it'll execute right up until the next case statement. So I'll go ahead and get this whole code converted over. And I'll think you see that the, it looks a little bit nicer because there's less you know, kind of syntax around it. and then end select. So now in this case, we're always looking here and we're gonna compare it to this one or to this one or to this one. Otherwise we'll do this. So I should be able to run that and have it process exactly the same. The reason that you should use um, select case when this is your condition is because to some other programmer, some future programmer who's looking at your code and realize that future programmer may be you. How long does it take for you to become completely disconnected from your code before you go back and look at code you wrote and, and say, I don't remember this at all. How long? Well, about two days. I thought you would say two years. Two years is way longer. Two days, probably, unless you're doing a lot of other coding in between, probably not two days, but it's not long. Uh, it's not long. And so this structure kind of jumps up and down and says, I'm looking at one thing and I'm comparing multiple things to it. Questions? Yeah. With the, the select case uh, setup, can you put cases like statements so you can put like uh, row F equals? I guess it's like it's redundant, but like let's say, like, like this is the case, like you want to just see if 
Ah, uh, wait, I almost thought I understood what you're going to say. Say it again. So like, let, let's say there's no color in that first case. It's checking to see if the color of the cell is red. It's checking to see, it's checking to see if, oh, it's checking to see if the color is red. Yes, but if you case different colors within that, and then it would like switch between them. Oh, you know, kind of like what the homework's asking you to do. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, I would, if I were doing the homework, I would use the select case statement to do the homework. Yeah, and I would probably just look at the background color index or the cell's color index of the active cell. And then based on whatever value that is on, I would then set the whole rows background color to the two, whatever one you want to do appropriately. Yeah, I thought that sounded like a really weird question. And then I realized, oh yeah, that's the homework. It is kind of a weird assignment. Okay, let's look at um of one a little bit different so this is going to give us a little more flexibility with um because there's some other interesting things that we can do with case but i do want to point out that you can put any expression here like this, anything that evaluates to a value here and you can put any expression here it doesn't just have to be you know a string value or a numeric value and it'll evaluate that evaluate the other one and check to see does that do they equal each other so they can be they can be pretty complex, although it looks pretty simple here. All right, let's do highlight three. I copy this and we'll go to highlight three. There's some, some, there's some other kind of interesting flexibility that we get kind of built into the select case statement. And let's say that, um, you know, we're looking over here and we've got, um, if we're interested in, so this is city of Chicago. Uh, I understand that the south side of Chicago is the baddest part of town if uh, the song about Leroy, Roy Brown is correct. So what I wanna do is I wanna kind of highlight these differently based on their latitude. So ones that are kind of the, the northernmost parts of the city, I wanna highlight these in a different color and maybe a few different colors down to the southernmost part of the city. Uh, and so I guess the first thing I wanna do is I wanna find out what, uh, what my, what my effective range is. Let me just ask really quickly for the minimum of column N. And let's also ask for the maximum of column N. So basically between 40, between, oh, there's not much range in there, is there? 41.7 to 42. So, okay. So that's the range that I've got to work with. Okay. So now I'm going to say select case, and I'm going to look now at column N instead of column F. And what I want to say here is that, let's see, what do I have? I have seven. I've just got a few different levels here. So let's say if it is less than, so here's the interesting part. I can say is less than, and then here put 42.75. So it's below 42.75, this will be true. So this is a little interesting because instead of having a condition that all sits together on one line, now we're saying I'm going to compare whatever this is to this in like this less than structure. In that case, let me go ahead and change N to be, now it turns out there's a function, oh shoot. There's a function called RGB, where you provide a, a number between 0 and 255 for how much red, how much green, and how much blue there is to kind of make up the color that you're looking for. So if I want to know, you know, what is all blue, that's going to be 0 red, comma, 0 green, 
comma zero, uh, 255 blue. So that is the number that means solid blue in the, in the, the numbering scheme for uh, VBA. Um, and so if I put all these the same, kind of the same amount of all three of those, it's gonna be somewhere on the scale between, uh, somewhere on the gray scale. So all zeros is going to be black. All six, uh, all 255s is going to be white. And then anything between that will be gray. So for this, I'm gonna say, I want the interior color to be RGB uh, and maybe, um, fit, or maybe we'll go in segments of 50, 50 comma 50 comma 50. So that should be kind of a dark gray. Uh, and then we can now just kind of uh, adjust this. Kind of for my other ones. So case is less than uh, 40, what were my numbers again? 4202. If it's less than that one, seven, so let's go to eight. 41.8. Then we're gonna go to 100. What do you have? Uh, 41.8. Let's do 85. Oops. 41.9. 95. 150. So this should just give us a different value of gray uh, for each of those. Um, different parts of the spectrum that we're looking at for latitude. Otherwise, I don't know, let's make it green. All right, let's run that and see what we get. Kind of more green than I really wanna see in there, but you can see that we're getting this different color banding that's happening in here. So um, let's just go ahead and put a breakpoint here and run this again, and just kind of watch with F8, we'll see what it's, where it's actually going. So let me um, print what its value is. All right, so we're at 41.79. So is that less than 41.75? 41.79, less than 41.75, true or false? Okay, so it's false. So they step through this, it should skip this one and check the next condition. Is it less than 41.8, true or false? We're 41.79, it's less than 40, yeah. So now we should actually step into this one, execute that line, and then we're done checking the conditions. Is more than one of these conditions true? Yeah. Um, that value is less than 41.8. It's less than 41.85. It's less than 41.9. It's less than 41.95. It's less than all these. There's a bunch of these that are true. It doesn't execute them all. Why? As soon as it finds the first one that's true, it's done checking and it jumps to the end. That's the same with the else if clause. As soon as it finds one's true, it doesn't look anymore. Even if, I mean, you know, suppose that I changed a value in here. I, I mean, it wouldn't make sense to do in this context, but I actually changed the latitude on the record such that the next one's true. It doesn't even check, so it won't know. So the point is a bunch of these can be true. It will just execute the first one that's true. Whew. Questions? 
Anything else you want to know about conditional branching? So executing different code based on some condition being true or false. There's nothing else I want you to know. You don't want to know anything else. I don't want to know anything else. Why don't I just dismiss class? That's a good question. Class dismissed. Thanks for coming. We'll see you next week.